the sort of alternative angles and it looked pretty well lit, we had probably about two hours of that. Uh, but we knew that that was nowhere near enough to be able to tell a quite a, uh, a human emotion story. You could kind of paint it by numbers, but it would be really reliant on talking heads. And so we knew we had to go out and find this footage. Uh, and I often kind of talk about that as if it's uh, like trying to solve a crime that never happened. Because um, we'd get in contact with all the people that worked at General Magic, and we'd say to them, do you by any chance have any photos? And some people would send us some photos. And we'd look through these photos, and in the back, we'd see someone with a Polaroid camera. And we're like, holy shit, maybe they've still got their photos. And I kind of joke about it, because we would not have been able to make this film in the UK. Like, in the States, no offense, you guys have a relatively short history, as opposed to our long, like, dating back to the Tudors. Um, you guys, like, store all of your stuff in huge garages, or garages, and, like, massive storage containers, and you don't you throw away... Americans hoarders? Yes, like, you guys are massive hoarders. And so, we just found that nobody chucked anything away. Um, and so, uh, when we actually stumbled upon the photo that showed someone holding a video camera, we were like, maybe that person still has their footage. And so we traveled to Hawaii. Did anyone have any, with any sort of like crazy pots of footage? Oh yeah, I mean, we like, so yeah, this Hawaii story, we found 300 hours of VHS. You found them or someone else found them? No, no, but like we had to go through this person's garage because he was like, oh, I think I've got some tapes. And it was 300 <laughs> hours. And he was like, oh, it's always good. If you can see rat poo, you know it's going to be fine. <laughs> and I was just like, what do you mean? He was like, because it's not inside the stuff. And I was like, this is a really shit job. <laughs> um, but I'm in Hawaii. Um, so yeah, uh, and then there was one tape that we actually watched at Emma's house uh, that like, changed the whole face of the movie. It was, it was shot by a magician of m other magicians. And they're all like goofing around on camera. And the way in which you get filmed by like a filmmaker, you're always going to like shut down because you're not really yourself. Like you're trying to present the best version of yourself. But if you're just being filmed by your friends, then you're just kind of just being really silly. And that's what like revealed so much character. And once we found that tape, it took us another four months to edit the film because we had to integrate it in a way that like, enriched the story rather than kind of tore it apart. So that took a bit of time. And um, Mark, you know, we see you flicking through that red book in the film. Um, is that is that a book you still have? I mean, is that something that you still look at? It's something that I still have. It's something that I did not look at until the film happened. Wow. And so how long? Uh, 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 19, it was published in 1989. That project published in 1989. I probably didn't look at it since then until a year ago. Yeah, I mean, I had I had it on my desk for about three years. Oh, so you three had that book on your desk for three years. Yeah. Because oh. you know, as you're making it, you're kind of making the film, you're oh, kind of yeah. constantly like referring to it and stuff. Oh, there are, so. two, co oh, there are two copies. There is, there, Mark's got one copy. There is another copy that's in existence. Okay. So, so, and then I read it because Joanna said she read it. I saw it in the film. She said, I read it. And it was amazing. So I read it and I thought, oh my God, this stuff is really quite powerful. And when I was preparing for the film, mm. I, I read it. And it was, yeah, it was amazing. So that, that <coughs> is, uh, so I also paint, paint it by paint. And I think oh, whoever here is creative, does a creative life or even sort of deep math or deep anything. When you, it's LA. It's LA. Everyone's creative. Everyone's creative. <laughs> Everyone's creative. And everyone goes to Bachelor Red Party. So, you know, is that moment when you utterly completely lose yourself and you're deaf and dumb and you, don't, you can't hear anything? And then the next day you come in and there's a, there's a, there's a canvas. That's how I felt about the book. So I'm glad it's there. <laughs> and maybe we'll digitize it uh, and, uh, and keep it. Or more importantly, given that you saw the future and pretty much wrote it down, number one, is there anything else that you want to share with this room about what the future looks like? And number two, have you taken the book and done a few edits? Is there anything, I mean... There is, what, there is, there is a weird bit where Mark talks about medical probes, and I was like, no, that's not going to work. Yeah. Is that, that, that didn't make it? It's a different film. port, I think, that you they, use. They weren't those probes at all. Um, no, but I am asked a slightly different question, Emma, which is, did you guys see anything other than it's all bright and optimistic and lovely. Mm. I'm an optimist. I have, I have... You're an entrepreneur. You must be. I'm an entrepreneur. You must be. You have to, in some sense, be stupid. And, or, 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 as I said in the film, you have to have such a powerful belief to escape or its gravity. You, you have to be positive. On the other hand, there are torpedoes out there. And proof that I'm an optimist still is I have a four-year-old at home and two 18-month-olds, a boy and a girl. So that's optimism. Because, uh, because otherwise one would think that the world is going to you know, end on them. But yes, we did. We, I, I remember when I made the first film, which where I was very, very young at the beginning, it was 1980, on the Information Society. 
we talked about problems of the information age. And Kara Swisher mentioned some. One, we talked about privacy. This is 1980. As being a big problem that we would lose ourselves, lose our sense of self mm. in, in, in this world of the future. It's correct. Second is information overload. That stuff would come at us in such torrents that it would be, in today's vernacular, impossible, you know, impossible to tell fact from fiction, fake from real. And what, how do you even process all that information? Where do you even, how do you do that? And the third one is information haves and have-nots, which we discussed in 1980, discussed again in 1989 and onward. And today we call it the digital divide, and we divide people by, you know, by, by race, by, by ethnicity, yes. by gender, by any other cut we possibly can. You've had 19 years. Have you solved any of this that we're just going through right now? <laughs> I feared it. And so when Facebook came around, I refused to participate. Don't, I mean, I have an account. I don't. I, I refuse to participate. I, I felt really bad about me checking out of the very thing that I wanted to create so badly, which is a community, a global community, of people who would intimately communicate with you. Yeah. We had a thing called FaceBase. You recall it? FaceBase was an early idea of Facebook, and we dropped it just like we dropped eBay because that was not that interesting. <laughs> um, but the very thing See, that we envisioned. Trusting people on the internet. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and exactly. And, and incidentally, again, the, 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 the iPhone or the Android phone is not that interesting without the web. And the, and the web is content, and content is largely self-created content called things like Facebook. Yeah. Um, and even though I, that's why we were working so hard, that's why we were on the floor. Remember when Mike said it, he was just devastated when it, was, it all came apart. We were working towards the very thing that when it showed up, I didn't want to participate. Puzzle. Yes, an absolute puzzle. Real puzzle. So, yeah, I felt that there was some dark side that, uh, that, that would eventually emerge. And this being LA, you know, I can say there would be no Trump without Twitter and Facebook. Yeah. It would be a, it would be a, it would be a, a punchline of his own joke. He'd be ridiculous. So, so did Twitter and Facebook, mostly Twitter, I think, actually, because he was able, like all, like most demagogues, to condense complexity into a, you know, into. Nothing. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Nothing. Um, you know, if I'd known in 1991 that in 2016 there'd be, a, you know, anybody here is a Republican, by the way. Please, <laughs> anybody dare reveal themselves? We're not. We're not going to show you the door. To be honest. You know that we would. That we would have a. That we would have a proto-fascist in the White House because yes. of the information tools and and environments yes. that we were working on so hard. Would I have not done it? It would have been a close call. Well, I think yes. We would have done it. Yes, that's it. You would have done it. You would have done it for sure. Because because we because we knew that something was essentially correct. It needed to be done. I mean, you know, you you did you you were the tools for that. I'm going to ask one more question and then open it to the audience. I mean, when I think about the general magic team, I'm like, this is like my class at high school, like just my class at high school being the guys that made everything, Nest, iPod, iPhone, yeah. eBay, you name it, yeah. which is just unheard of. Is there, some, you know, I, I know that I'm probing for like magic ingredients that like, because we all want to know just in case there's anything we don't know about, but is what what was it about this group of people together? And, and I'd love a short answer from both of you, because Matt may have a different perspective having sort of, you know, spent hours and hours watching you all from afar. I'd love to just, do you have any thoughts on that? No? You go first. You go first. Oh, boy. Um, first of all, it's hard, uh, you know, it's hard to say stuff and at the same time not engage in hubris and, and so on. But oh, it, yes. The people that were there, you know, I, yes, I said things. And those things I felt with a, incredible clarity and conviction. That was authentic. And that authenticity went to Bill Atkinson and, 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 and Bill brought in Andy. They are rock stars. Uh, in those days, it sounds silly because probably a lot of people in this room know how to code. But in those days, they had lists of um, of programmers, the best programmers in the planet, the ten best programmers. Bill and Andy were on. So the combination, the confluence of the idea, the itself, the vision, the strategy, I guess, that uh, I brought in, the technology and the technologists that they brought in, stir the you know stir the pot, and we thought it was right. But as Mike said, the timing was. So, so you have to be, the timing is the torpedo. But the people, the ideas, everything was in place for, for us to 
to do what is now a $500 billion a year revenue industry. Yeah. That is, that there are 3 billion users of smartphones. Many more smartphones than that, but 3 billion users. Uh, so that's 3 sevenths of planet Earth. And uh, who here would give up their smartphone or their, you know, their, you know, their, their, their web for a year? Anybody volunteer to give it up for a year? One. Good job. Well done. Um, I don't know if you'll make it through. Yeah. So anyway, so that's a long, you didn't want a long answer. You got a long well, answer. I meant just like, was there like, you know, it's just because I don't know about everybody in the audience, but you spectate on the film and you're like, what, you know, there's just, just there are so many, so many, not just successes, however you define that, were just incredibly interesting things that came, you know, like the emoji, where we use them every single day. It's it's, just, you know. the, the personalities that existed, I think, at General Magic uh, were so accessible. So if you have someone like Andy Hertzfeld and Bill Atkinson that were kind of treated <coughs> like rock stars, that, but they were also so available to everybody that was working around them. And it's when I kind of, we try not to get too like immersed in the tech part of within the film because we can feel like we kind of lose audience members. But I always kind of think about that the device that they made existed off a one megabyte RAM and a one megabyte memory card. You know, like a, an iPhone picture is like six megs. And they, had, they were running off a sixth of that with all of the ecosystem that we all use today. So they were squeezing out just like so much from just tiny kilobytes. Uh, and I think that's what makes the engineers that exist today, because now we're dealing with gigabytes and terabytes worth of the same amount of capability these and silicon giants, and lithium. We talk about on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. These are the but giants. But they just because they, they were having to tinker around with nothing, so that suddenly when you've got everything, they're able to explode with it. So I think it's a mixture yeah. of kind of like working with like almost 80s and 90s technology, and then when you get all of the components that we now all use today, they could take all of those lessons and actually put them into real world solutions that exist today. So yeah, I think in a way you have to kind of slum it with having nothing so that when you do have everything, you can lead on it, I think. Mike Stern, what's the answer to the question? Mike is the general counsel, he's in the film, he's executive. Where are you? Sneaker He's sitting there. quietly trying to be. <laughs> How about a hand for Mike? Yeah. How about a hand for Mike? <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what was the magic and magic, the uh, general magic uh, that enabled all this? What did you experience? <laughs> Yeah, I was just a lawyer, not a technologist. Um, what was special about it was more than accessibility, as a matter of fact, Andy and Bill and Mark, as Mark was my teacher, um, they were superb teachers. They wanted to pass along what they knew and how and the creativity that they possessed as artists, and they thought of themselves as artists, not as software engineers. They wanted to pass that along to the next generation, and they did it with a zeal and a passion and an openness that was really extraordinary. And that's why the kids went on to do such amazing things, because that spirit, they were imbued with that spirit. But, um, and, and their disciples, Andy and Bill's disciples, Phil Goldman and, and the next tier, and Darren, who you saw in the movie, they were the same kind of people. They wanted to teach, and they were absolutely brilliant at it. And you know, that made us closer than <clears throat> we would have ordinarily been. Thanks, thank you. Awesome. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Because this is a fairly unique moment to ask some questions, and now we sneakily know that Mike's here. Feel free to tell us if you want to ask Mike. Uh, over there. I'm so sorry. I left my glasses at home. I just saw some hands. I'm going to say to the gentleman at the back first. I can't, put his I hand can, up I can't even way. see gender. So I don't cap, mean it. Cap I don't mean it. Cap back, so. 21st century way. I just can't see. Yes, sir. Um, I love the film. Thank you for making it. Um, Mark. Um, my question is for you. You have had a brilliant vision and you assembled a brilliant team. Um, the, the film has the message that like, the Achilles heel of general magic was the timing. But I wonder if there was something else, and I want to get your thoughts on this. It seemed like there was a disconnect between the, the visionary you the, and my fundraising and all that and then the engineering team, which was trying to build it. And there was a point in the film where they didn't want to have an engineering manager. And um, had you had an engineering manager or a product manager, that would, would, things be, really would things be different? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Would things be different if they had a... Right. Yeah. Is, yeah. is that... Yeah. Is that, was yeah. that really big? Was, there, was that the missing... Was that the Achilles heel, really, of general magic? And had you had someone really focused on product market fit, getting into market, talking with customers early on, 
and yeah. really just like coming up with a reasonable roadmap for execution a lot more incrementally, like the iPad. I think the I think you posed a rhetorical question. You answered your own question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're all members of the would have, should have. What's the third word? Could have club. And so now, in retrospect, we know a lot of things, like what you just said. We also know that that you know the, the internet, which when I was a PhD student at Stanford, I was working on it for, with Vin Cerf, for Vin Cerf, who was one of the forefathers of the internet. There were 14 computers, 14, and I was working on uh, security. Uh, but the web came, and if we had had less of a disconnect, as you said, or maybe hadn't <coughs> been so exhausted, spiritually and physically and financially exhausted, we would have torn down everything we were doing and pivoted like instantly. Uh, which, by the way, we did. We embedded, you know, we embedded, embedded native internet code into the ROM and shipped it. But by then it was too late. So there are all kinds of things. You know, uh, would have, should have, could have is a very, very powerful source of backward-looking wisdom. Mm. So I, I, yes, one of the one of them was what you just said. I guess it was lessons learned to be applied to next time, which is, I guess, what some of the magicians did. Yep, absolutely. You know, um, yep. And there was also there was a kind of change of how technology was released. So in the 80s, you'd ship a product that would last for, say, five years, and that kind of followed the same trajectory into the 90s. But then when we got into the zeros, we started to kind of go into iterative technology. So your first iPod would be much, much worse than the second iPod, and the third and fourth and fifth, and it took seven years of iPods to make the iPhone. But because we were so used to using an iPod, we could just instantaneously adopt a smartphone. And now, you know, if you think back, like, in the early 2000s, you know, people were walking around with mobile phones, but it was still kind of very generational. There was only kind of like, it wasn't like there was a mass adoption. But then suddenly smartphones were everywhere, and everybody can use them. But it's because it's happened iteratively that we've kind of become experts of it, and we don't have to kind of learn it all over again, which is what we used to do with technology. You know, you'd have a computer where your manual would be like this big. I know that we had a question over there. In a yeah, I just wondered if Steve Jobs, if you were in contact with Steve Jobs in the early years, yeah, I didn't work for him directly because by the time I came to Apple, he had been fired. So, so, I, so Scully was the, the CEO at the time. But Steve came in to, uh, Andy brought him in early uh, because Andy wanted to see, he put us in a room. I mean, we went into a conference room, shut the door. And Steve was a killer, obviously. I mean, he, knows he, he either loved what you were doing or he'd rip you apart. So I think Andy sort of wanted to see what would happen. <laughs> and we went through this, you know, sort of session um, and he came out and he's, you know, he went to Andy, I didn't see this, he went two thumbs up, this is great, this is the real deal, uh, what you guys are working on. And then over, the, you know, during the years, it, there was contact in and out between, between Steve and Andy and Bill and some people that we hired from Next and, and so on, but, but he and I didn't work side by side. He did work side by side with Tony Fidel. And Joanna. And with, jo yeah, to Joanna in the first instance, yeah. and then Tony <coughs> Fidel in the second generation. Mm -hmm. By then, we understood what's now called lean methodology, which is what you were trying to say, what you were trying to say. Lean methodology was not the Apple culture yeah. of 1989. It was, uh, and lean basically says, you know, you, you just, it's what you were talking about. We all know it until you. Uh, but that's the, that's the answer. Steve, Steve was always a presence, but not someone I worked with directly. That would, it would have been really nice to have done so. And he would have taken over the company and that would have been maybe okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, jo and Joanna has often said in the past that you know, when asked for reflections that, you know, that he may have been a tough character but that he was toughest on himself and that is something that, you know, following the, the release of the Steve Jobs movie was, she was very keen to yeah. emphasize. It's interesting. The Apple culture is described to me as you read in the Walter Isaacson books or see in the movies. Uh, was terrifying. It was harsh. It was, it was <coughs> spooky. You were either the greatest thing in the world or you were trash. And, uh, and you, you lived with this personality that was very mercurial in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a calculated way. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, impulsively mercurial. It, was, it didn't come across that way. It came across as manipulative. The general magic culture it was, was benign. It was all kind of hippie group. It was much more... What you feel like. It was loving. It was, uh, it was respectful. And there was no character. I, as a, as you know, I didn't want to become an iconic, you know, cult figure, which is not in me. It's, it's not relevant. So we tried to create a culture that was very, very um, uh, family. Yeah. And that's not necessarily, that's not necessarily correlates with success. Is that is that sometimes 
the culture needs Strong leader. a headbanger yes. and who doesn't really care what people think of him or her. Uh, <coughs> and being liked and uh, uh, is not the same thing as being successful. Yes. They're very different. I didn't know that person. Food for thought for anyone here growing a business. Uh, we had a question from here. Um, I have a question, and I, I think it's for the filmmaker, but um, it is, when I, when I was watching this movie, it's how do you make it a happy ending? Because I started feeling a lot of, from your point of view, a lot of resentment for the iPhone getting made, not a lot of joy. And then when I saw you say the joy, I kind of felt it. But as a filmmaker, how do you like, mm -hmm. how do you harness that journey? You make a choice. Yeah. Um, but I think, so, uh, I'm not going to try and get too political, sorry, Sil. Um, <laughs> but, you know, before I started working on this film, Brexit <coughs> hadn't happened, Trump mm -hmm. hadn't happened, the Paris Change Accord had been passed, and it sounded like yeah. we were all going to get behind it. Um, you know, my belief, or my hope is with like making this film is hopefully it inspires people. And that if it means that you're going to reapproach an idea that you, you cast aside because it didn't work in the past, or you just haven't had the confidence to try it before, is, is that we are all responsible for the change that we want to see in the world. And that sounds ridiculously cliched, but it's true. Because our governments aren't going to do it, and corporations sure as fuck aren't going to do it. So we all have to be part of this solution. And so to interject a happy ending, and to make people feel inspired by the, you know, the, the hardship, is so that hopefully we will all walk away and go like, yeah, actually, I can, I can be a part of the solution, because we need solutions, I think. And, and even, when, even when things look dark, or yeah. people look and great, things can happen. And it looks pretty dark right now. Um, I'm going to, sorry, thank you for your question. I'm going to go straight to Sia. So Sia is uh, our youngest ever audience member, I think, ever watching the film. Sia's uh, 10 years old. And Sia's got a question, I think. So. Okay, well, what was the hardest part? Did she stand? Because I can't hear. Ah. <laughs> sure. What was the hardest part of making this film? Working with Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent uh, question. You hit the nail on the head there. Yeah, I, it's, it's quite, when you're, um, uh, it's, it's kind of like being a marathon runner. Because you, yeah, even though you get really, really tired, you still have to keep on going. And uh, like, it, it sounds, again, quite cliche to say it. It's not enough to love the thing that you're making. You have to love the people that you're making it with because they'll be the ones that carry you. And when it's really, really hard, and it is, having people around you that will pick you up and tell you it's worth doing is the most important thing. So having like an amazing fiancé uh, and you know, incredible friends like yourself uh, makes it possible. Mark a high and a low of being part of this because this must be you know you said you've seen it five times but it but you you felt the emotions there so a high and a low from the film during the film or yes and from the process of making the film well the process of making the film was the was the initial decision emotional decision to re, to reveal vulnerability be authentic even though all my instincts were don't do that <laughs> I'd reconciled that. For myself, and I'd moved on. In privacy. In privacy, yes. and and it was not something that it's not my nature to have shared that public. Well, this so is a bit of a journey. It's it is a you know, so so I came to terms with that um, as I was watching you know the first act in the sort of sort of halfway to the side. I knew what was coming on the other side. You know, some of you may have, but I knew exactly what was coming. And it was like sitting there, you know, perils of Pauline. It was the train was coming across the track, and and we were still, you know, tied to it. Um, and it was I felt the sadness. There was one image there where I had a blank stare on my face, which to me read I don't know if you noticed that to me read like classic depression, completely no emotion, kind of a stone face, because as CEO as leader, I had to never show that. Yeah. Yeah, because people cue off you. Go on. Yeah. People cue off you emotionally, and uh, and you're responsible for the you know, for everyone. So so the best I could muster was stone faced. But I knew it was I know what I felt inside. I still remember that. And the joy was something that that keep coming up over and over. Yesterday there was a there was a, a, a lovely screening and kind of a therapy session at the end, I guess. <laughs> and, a, and a young man came and said, "You must be so happy to know that that you have." what you've done, what you've unleashed through all these other people, that if, if a person has that, even a movie made about them, I could agree, about something that you say, that's my life work. 
I, I did it. Whatever it was that I'm, I'm not going to do anything like that again. I did it once, and if, and if you can say that's you did it, you should be happy. It was like prescriptive. You should be happy, and I believed him last night. Yeah, that's good. I believed him. He uh, he gave me a gift of uh, of not having to just dwell on the the pain and the defeat, even though I think the pain and the defeat is probably more interesting to an audience and probably more relevant to an audience than the sense of completeness and. Yeah. And, you know, so, so. I know and I, there's different answers from everybody about this, but for, for those of you that remember Bill in the movie, he was wearing the crazy um, Hawaiian shirts and smelled like a goat, um, I think was uh, one of the comments in there. You know, he was at, uh, at one of the screenings in the past, and, and, and I think it was the first time that he'd seen the movie, Matt, and he had, you know, I think it's been cathartic for people in different ways, because he, he cried on stage, if I remember correctly. Yeah. It's pretty emotional. Um, time for another question or two, maximum. Oh, the rule is only one more because yeah. the boss is right here. <laughs> and, I, and I can't be judgmental on who and I can't really see, so I'm going to let Matt. Can I add that to man in the cap, please? Yes, yeah, okay. yeah, so um, we heard words like artist, and um, obviously the film is about collaboration and hippie idealism, you use the word. And I think Steve Jobs often talked about his kind of liberal arts background and his interest in beauty. So these kind of super high ideals. And I was a college kid in the 80s. And I remember that being part of the rhetoric of the coming computer revolution. Do you have hope that, that those ideals, which were, I think, enlivened your work and were part of the early rhetoric, can come to the foreground again? Are you hopeful? That's the spark that the 10-year-old is caring right now. And our job is not to damage her. And she'll bring her natural, you know, lovely self forward. And and our job is to give her the tools to fend off bad things. Um, my daughter who's four who's gonna so you you have you have the honor for just <laughs> a couple of weeks because she's four years old, she's gonna come see the movie and she's very excited to come see the movie. Because at the Roxy and the Castro, when I showed it to her and I said, Daddy's in this movie, and she remembers the movie being made in our house, what she got really excited about was in the lobby, there's a popcorn stand and a candy rack. <laughs> That's exciting. But, but she now knows, when I asked her, what's Daddy's job? She says, protect, love, teach. That's my job as her dad, as her father. And... What does that mean? It means that it's a, it's a belief that I have that, that Sia, Sia is, is the representation of the perfect answer to your question. The kids are there. They have it. We need to protect, love, and teach. And, and all of that humanity will continue to bubble forward. And the people, and by the way, you really can ask my daughter, Four years old, what is daddy's job? She will exactly say those three words. <laughs> and, and today, making technology is very easy. It's all plug and play software and plug and play hardware and plug and play telecommunications. It's really easy. And it, and it, and it iterates like a, I mean, it's, it's as rapid as anything biological ever iterated. Which means that new things can happen tomorrow. Things are being worked on tonight by teams all over the world that are amazing and dangerous and artistically incredible and just ugly. So all of that's going to come to the fore and it's being run as Tony, you know, as Andy Hertzfeld said at the computer, history is in by 20 years and, and younger. So, uh, you know, so for us, you know, sort of get, a, get some popcorn and, you know, then let's see what transpires. With the technology, that effectively is enabled by everything that you guys did under that roof. So with that, yeah. I was going to. You have something else to say, which is Five we want to hear. Not we is didn't know magic? about we didn't know about uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, mm -hmm. quantum computing. Yeah. Those are the things that are right in front of us that actually are going to make this stuff seem quite quaint. But, you know, those are the, as I said you know, at the beginning, the, it, we talk about building things as on shoulders of giants, yeah. you know, and you have to have, you know, yeah. bite-sized chunks, none of, 
none of the things that you're mentioning now would have been possible no. without Correct. any of the things we saw. So, you know, to, to have two giants in the room is very special. I'd like to thank Mark and Matt for um, doing the today. One final thing to add, and it sounds like Matt does too, which is, um, you know, we have, we are doing a collection of screenings across the USA and then globally over the coming months. Do please follow us or share this on General Magic Move, which is the um, Twitter account, um, and uh, in due course, be able to download the film and spread it further and wider. And um, so please be our evangelists. Um, when that happens. And Matt, you have asked, um, So I've got like an audience participation thing. Can everybody sort of like come to the centre? Because what I'm going to ask you guys to do is like take out your cell phones, put the flashlight on, and then turn them towards me. I'm going to just take a photo of you guys, but I'm going to get everyone to stand up. We're kind of just kind of bunch together. So if you're in the front row, move back. If you're in the back row, come forward and use the central spaces. I'm just going to get a photo of you guys. So flashlights on, and turn them towards me. So, come even closer. Come on in. Come on into the centre. If you're short, go high. Everybody on? Point them really high up so I can see you guys. Ready? In three, two, one. There for a second. Changing settings. I'm kind of waving around like you had a great time. A <laughs> panic <laughs> disco concert. Yeah. That's for you, Dan. Movie maker <laughs> and audience. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. We want to chat with you, but we have to go out to the.